This is Conspiranormal. Oh, hey guys, welcome back to Conspiranormal. It's your host, Adam, in case nobody knew. And Serfiel is here as well. Hello. Looking forward to the Strange Realities Conference here coming up in September. We've just been doing a lot of work uh, getting ready for that. Yeah, we have. That, that we have. September 26th through 27th, guys. You ought to join us there. And uh, as usual, guys, we're going straight into the guest. Um, we've got fascinating, interesting stuff to talk about. This is a subject that I really didn't know much about. Of course, I had heard of it, but we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, we want to welcome Dr. Stephen Finley to the show. Dr. Finley, welcome to Conspiracy Normal. Good evening, and thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming on. This is awesome. Uh, you were uh, a couple of months, two or three months ago on our good friend Greg Bishop's Radio Mysterioso, and Serfiel had told me about about you, and I had actually sent you an email after that, and we were able to get connected. And I believe you also know our good friend David Metcalf. I think yeah. you're familiar with him too. Yeah. yeah, I met I met David Metcalf at one of the Esalen meetings, and we've been in, we've been in touch ever since. Cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now you're a, a professor of religion. Is that correct? I'm, I'm jointly appointed at Louisiana State in both religious studies and African and African American studies, and I'm the director of the African and African American Studies program at LSU. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Was that recently? I saw. I saw you made an announcement recently about some changes, or is is that program uh, well, I've, new? I've, I've been at LSU since 2008, and since then, AAAS, as we call it, that's African and African American Studies, has been a program. And the announcement that you probably saw a few weeks ago probably was about the, the, the plans to make AAAS a department, which is really big news. Oh, cool. So instead of being a program with limited resources and only a few faculty, it's going to be a, a full department. And that's that's really exciting. And again, that's really big news. Excellent. Well, congratulations on, on all that. Thank you. So we're going to talk about the nation of Islam, but mm -hmm. specifically in relation to the UFO phenomenon. And I know oh. a lot of people don't usually put those together, <laughs> that's but, right. it's, but it's an essential, <laughs> an actual essential part of the nation of Islam's beliefs. That's right. So I, I thought before we got into into that, uh, we could kind of talk about, kind of lay the groundwork on like the history of the Nation of Islam, like where it comes from, sure, and who kind of the leaders were mm -hmm. up to now to Louis Farrakhan, of course, mm -hmm. is the, who's the, who's the primary subject of what we're talking about. Sure. Well, the Nation of Islam traces their uh, founding to 1930. And uh, interestingly enough, they claim July 4th as the date in which they were founded. So yesterday, for example, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, offered, delivered a, a, a speech for about three hours. And uh, it was a July 4th uh, celebration, but that's also for them their anniversary. So yesterday was marks 90 years in which they've been in existence. So I, I, I say that with one caveat. The Nation of Islam led by Louis Farrakhan to a certain extent is also kind of new. And what I mean by that is uh, in 1975, the, the primary leader and prophet of the Nation of Islam died. And that was Elijah Muhammad in 1975. And after that, there were a lot of people claiming the legacy and the true legacy of Elijah Muhammad. So a lot of times when people ask me to speak on the nation of Islam, I, I say it sort of facetiously, but also sort of seriously, I ask which one? Right. Because there, there are multiple groups that call themselves the nation of Islam. So the main one that we're discussing is the one led by Louis Farrakhan. That actually was started or in their language reconstituted in 1978. Right. So by all intents and purposes, the nation of Islam under Elijah Muhammad is no longer in existence. 
And he was the first leader, not the founder, the first leader who took over right around 1933 through 1975. And again, he died in 1975 and, uh, and there were multiple splits and so on. And uh, Louis Farrakhan reconstituted the Nation mm -hmm. of Islam. And when we get to the, the conversation about the UFO uh, uh, narrative, that plays a big part in, in how he was able to justify and claim the legacy of Elijah Muhammad, the prophet of the Nation of Islam. But it was originally founded by who? Who was the original founder? In 1930, there was a, a, a mysterious man of, um, of unknown lineage. Uh, he was racially ambiguous. And he, he, he called himself by many names, but the name that stuck was Farad Muhammad. Right. And so you hear the Nation of Islam talk about Master Farad, F-A-R-D. And um, and he, he would you know, he was he was a, a peddler. Some uh, uh, characterize him as he would go door to door and selling silks and other things in the black community of Detroit in 1930 and uh, what used to be called Paradise Valley. But while he was selling, he, he, he was also telling the, the people in the community about their true origins. For example, a, a famous term uh, that was used is that you are not Negro, right? which was a common term then. And so he would, he would tell them about their true history. And it was right around then that he started what used to be called Allah's Temple of Islam. And the Nation of Islam grew out of that. And so uh, very, very early on in the 19, uh, 30s, probably around uh, 31 or late 1930 is when Elijah Muhammad is attending these meetings of Master Fard Muhammad. And then after uh, Master Fard Muhammad departed, because the story about what happened to him is also shrouded in mystery. Did he die? Did he, did he leave? Did he ascend? Right? Um, but Elijah Muhammad then became the, the, the prophet and they mythologize uh, Master Fard Muhammad as well as what happened to him uh, uh, at 1933 when he disappeared. And we could talk a little more about that if you like. Uh, Noble Jew Ali founded what's called the Moore Science Temple of America. And some scholars trace the origins of the Nation of Islam to the more science temple. So, so it is rumored that Master Fard Muhammad was a member of the more science temple, right? So I want to be clear, this is what yes. some scholars say, this is what some of the rumors are, but the Nation of Islam denies this relationship, mm -hmm. right? They and this is also in that context of all these new religious movements in early, early 20th century, a lot of them being inspired by really like what happened in the Chicago World's Fair and things like that. That's right. So there's, there's a lot of new religious movements going on, and there's a particular flavor of those within the African-American community. That's right. And, and the Moore Science Temple was one of them, which started, I believe, around 1913 in Newark, New Jersey, by a gentleman by the name of Timothy Drew, who became Noble Drew Ali. And so what you what you have in in this organization is is a lot of mythology that draws from Freemasonry and some would argue theosophy and Islam and all kinds of ideas. And this is this is the background of the nation of Islam. Again, some argue that Master Fard Muhammad, who would go on to to to, to start the nation of Islam, had previously been a disciple of noble Drew Ali and a member of the Moore Science Temple. Now, I should also say that, that some records indicate that uh, Master Fard Muhammad was also involved in other groups, including some contact with theosophy. So again, this is sort of the, the, the historian's view of trying to put mm -hmm. this together from the documents and the reports and so on. But again, this is, this is a, these are claims that the Nation of Islam denies. According to the Nation of Islam, this guy, Master Fard Muhammad, shows up in Detroit in 1930, telling black people their true nature, their true history, and their true religion. And out of this, uh, the Nation of Islam uh, begins, apparently on July 4th, 1930. So 
I guess the the disappearance of Master Far Muhammad it, it it reminded me a lot of like the hidden imam. That's exactly like, right. Like like he's occulted. I guess is the term. Well, that's that's precisely what Elijah, uh, what uh, Louis Farrakhan says, though, that he is the mm -hmm. Mahdi. And so you're exactly right to use that reference about occultation. And so one could argue that that he is occulted at this point in the mother wheel, which which we're going to get to. At some okay. point. That allowed for Elijah Muhammad to uh, claim transmission from him and to um, continue to say he was continuing Fard's work because Fard disappeared. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So he disappears in 1933, and there are all these rumors that he was arrested by the police, that he was seen in California, that he ended up in, uh, uh, in prison in Northern California. Uh, there are FBI uh, records, of course, which if, if you trust those, and I'm not sure I do, <laughs> right, they, they claim to know who he was. And they say he was a man by the name of Wallace Dodd Ford, right? And so, but the interesting thing is Master Fard's initials were W.D., right? W.D. Uh, and his first name was, uh, was Wallace. So you take W.D. Farad, and they say he was Wallace Dodd Ford, the FBI. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, the, the records say that he was a mixed parentage, some some say that he has Pakistani lineage. Uh, uh, others say that uh, uh, they traced part of his lineage to, to New Zealand. Of course, some of this is in the FBI records and so on. Uh, none of this is really clear. It's, it's all ambiguous and shrouded in mystery. And of course, where there is mystery, mm -hmm. it gives us an opportunity or, or religious group an opportunity then to mythologize. Yes. To give an account, to try to make sense out of that mystery. And one of the things uh, uh, the Nation of Islam says about his appearance, uh, because he, he, he's not phenotypically black. If you saw a picture of uh, Master Fard Muhammad, and there are only a few, if you, yeah. if you Google him, he looks like a white man. Yeah. Right? yeah. Mm -hmm. All right? And so the Na Nation of Islam, and um, in fact, Minister Farrakhan was just talking about this a few days ago, they, they claim in their mythology that he had to be of mixed parentage of both a black father and a white mother so that he, he could pass. Do you guys know what racial passing is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, okay, all right. So, so the mythology says that he had to, to, to appear the way he did so that he could gather intelligence in white communities right. and not be perceived as black. And so that's one of the ways that they mythologize his mysterious and, uh, uh, appearance and his um, his ambiguous uh, uh, physiognomy, right? And so all these things show up uh, in their mythology to try to explain who this guy was. But but the bottom line is, Elijah Muhammad supposedly studied with him for three years in in a master disciple relationship, so that after he departed, like you suggested, uh, Elijah Muhammad then claimed that he was the rightful heir to to his teachings. And so in Detroit in 1930, July 4th, uh, is, when we, is when the Nation of Islam begins with Master Farad Muhammad. 19, roughly 1933 is when Elijah Muhammad takes over. So you've kind of got this chain of transmission of authority from Master Farad to Elijah Muhammad. And then later, Farrakhan claims that, that authority. And... So that 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 puts in the 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 UFO contactee kind of um, experience that he has. There's there's an element of that to that. But that's exactly right. But it, because it gets complicated. Yeah. So Elijah Muhammad really isn't challenged that much from 1933 until he dies in February 1975. I mean, he is the ruler. That yeah. that doesn't mean that there isn't that there aren't questions at times from people who are part of the movement. Some of those major questions came from his own family, yeah. uh, from his son, Wallace, for example, uh, who ended up being close to Malcolm X, but also his, his son. I forget his son who actually studied in Egypt at, uh, at Al-Azhar and, um, and learned Arabic and that kind of thing. So, so there were questions about the nature of this Islam, 
right, right. from his own family. And Wallace, in fact, uh, was excommunicated uh, more than mm. once. Uh, that was his, I think, his seventh born son hmm. was communicated, uh, excommunicated more than once uh, for questioning and doubting um, and, and making claims that his father was not teaching true Islam. And so, so it gets kind of complicated. So when 1975 uh, uh, comes around, uh, Elijah Muhammad, who had been, been sick, dies. Right. And so the question then is, who's going to be the leader, you know, and who is the putative leader of the nation of Islam. Well, the putative leader would seem to be the person who was the minister of temple number seven, which was the temple in Harlem. If you all recall, that's the temple that uh, over, over which Malcolm X was the minister. Yes. Uh -huh. In Harlem. Right. Uh, until he died, was killed in 1965. And as you know, much to his chagrin, he was always called the number two man. Right. right. And so when so when so when Minister Farrakhan was was given this this post uh, was given Temple Number Number Seven, and he was the national spokesperson for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he was the one who would seem uh, to be positioned to uh, succeed his father, uh, succeed Elijah Muhammad when he died. But Wallace outmaneuvered him, um, and some would say strong arm Farrakhan. And, and couched um, his right to take over the nation of Islam uh, in some of the earlier things uh, um, uh, that his father had said, um, that, that he read as prophetic. For example, um, uh, Wallace was the seventh child, right? And so in, in many folklores, the number seven is sort of a special number, especially if you're the seventh son, like he was. And so he, mm -hmm. he pointed to things like that to say that he was chosen. And Farrakhan just feels like he was demoted, <laughs> right? Because he thought that he was gonna be the leader of the nation of Islam. And instead, Wallace Muhammad takes over the nation of Islam and immediately starts deconstructing the nation of Islam and moving it toward a more Sunni form of Islam mm -hmm. or a more mainstream form of Islam. Okay, which was what kind of what Malcolm X was trying to do too. That's, that's right. And yeah. so we're talking roughly here between 1975 and maybe 1977 or so. And so it was right around 1977, early 1978, that Minister Farrakhan announced to Brock Peters, uh, who, was an, who was a black actor at the time. And I can see his face in my mind, uh, uh, but I can't remember some of the movies that he, uh, that he made. But it's interesting that he made this announcement to an actor. He was one of the first ones Farrakhan told that he was going to reconstitute the nation of Islam. So he left, right? And in some ways, he felt like he was actually excommunicated. So that's another nuance to this story. So when I say that uh, the nation of Islam, as we presently understand it, as led by Louis Farrakhan, is a new organization, this is part of the background. Right. right? Because, because Wallace Muhammad, who became Warwick Dean Muhammad, he changed his name, right, moved the, uh, the nation of Islam to, to much more orthodox, and I, I kind of hate that term, much more mainstream right. uh, uh, forms of Islam. So that the nation of Islam that we know or that we knew previously was no longer in existence. Farrakhan took a few remnants, basically, and lots of new people who joined to build what we now understand as the nation of Islam. And so this was in, uh, again, right around 1978. And so that's, that's, that's the context. Uh, okay. And so uh, just to say a little bit more about it. So when we get to 1985, um, there are lots of rival groups to the nation of Islam. Lots of people claiming the right to be the nation of Islam. They're, they're claiming to be the heirs of Elijah Muhammad's legacy. And this includes Elijah Muhammad's brother, John Muhammad, who started the nation of Islam. Uh, Silas Muhammad, whose form of a uh, nation of Islam is even, is even more conservative than Farrakhan's. Even today, there uh, is Royal Jenkins Group, which was called the United Nation of Islam. Uh, yeah. There was the 5% uh, the nation of Islam. 
There's a, there's a nation of Islam to this day led by a person who calls himself son of man. So even now, there are lots of groups and offshoot groups from the, uh, uh, the original, what we would call the original nation of Islam. And again, that's all important background to understanding how I think this UFO narrative functions. The Royal Jenkins, his group is, is interesting too. I actually saw a documentary about them not that long ago. That was like a series about uh, about cults. Yeah, well, then you saw me. I was actually in that special. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. If if you if you go back and look at that, which which appeared on a uh, A and E. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah, and yeah. I was I was the so called African American religion expert. Oh, <laughs> and, and, that was you. And, and okay, that was me. cool. That was me. Yeah. And they put me in some ways counter to this woman who was the so called cult expert, and we just argued a lot. <laughs> Mostly off camera. You're not going to see it. We we argued a lot, in in part because I felt like the 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 category cult. First of all, I don't think there's any such thing as as, as a cult. I, I think these are all emerging religions, right. and all religions start somewhere. Cult has a real negative connotation. Yeah. Real we've, negative connotation. we've used it a lot too, but right, yeah. right. Well, and this the sociologist who was the so-called cult expert and I just argued off camera about that constantly. Because I felt like once you call it a cult, then apparently that was going to give any cult expert mm. capital to talk right. about any group that was labeled that when, in fact, they weren't really informed about this group at all. Yeah, and there's so probably I, a lot of racial dimensions to it with people and, kind and, of like discounting. And, that's, and that's the other point that I was making, right? Yeah. The, the, the way that labels like cult marginalize groups that are that are already on the margins. Uh, and, and the way that, that the term cult emerged in the 1950s as something that related to Asian religions, mm, right? So, yeah. so it's already mm. racially inflected in, mm. in the negative. And so I just had all kinds of problems. Um, but, but, you know, the, the choice in those, in those situations is either we, we do the shows and try to bring some balance to it, or we don't do it, yeah. and they just end up being awful. So... So I decided yeah. to go on and at least try to bring some balance to the conversation. Well, what, what did you think about, I mean, I don't mean to get off on a tangent too much here, but what did you think about some of the things that that young man was talking about? Well, I know, by the way, his name was Elijah Muhammad. Yeah, uh, that's right. And, that's right. And he goes mm -hmm. by uh, Eli yeah. uh, for, for short. I, I like Eli. I think he's a, he's a smart young man. Um, I, I kind of felt, I kind of felt in some ways that the show took a really sensationalistic approach. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That, that's, that could, that's, that's television. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. That, yeah. that could have been nuanced much more right. because even Eli's parents continue to be in the United Nations of Islam, which is called uh, Value Creators now. Uh, and there's a backstory yeah. to that, too. They're called Value Creators. So so this is really, you know, it's it's a really complicated story. I mean, he's out but his family and other relatives still find it meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. And so shows like, like the ones you're talking about that you saw don't offer that kind of nuance. They really are just trying to sensationalize and frankly pathologize these newer and smaller religions. And, um, and he sort of got caught in that, right? He so then in this, in this background of all these competing um, heirs to the Nation of Islam, uh, Farrakhan uses a, a UFO experience, right, to tie himself to that um, to that that lineage of Elijah Muhammad and Fard. Well, that's that's precisely what what I'm arguing is that. Uh, so he's not the first, though, uh, mm -hmm. to, to claim um, a UFO experience. I mean, obviously, it's rooted in the Nation of Islam uh, and the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. Elijah right. Muhammad very early on was talking about the mother plane. And going back to 1942, when the Nation of Islam was raided by the FBI, one of the claims that members of the Nation of Islam make is that the FBI confiscated drawings of the mother wheel, right? Actual drawings that belong to Elijah Muhammad of this UFO. Wow. And so in, in it was around 1970. So I think. I think Royal Jenkins joins the Nation of Islam very late in 1973. 
And so roughly around 1975, he actually leaves. He actually leaves before Elijah Muhammad dies. Uh, one of two movements I know that came out uh, of the Nation of Islam before Elijah Muhammad died. All the rest were after February, February 75. So in 1975, Royal Jenkins actually claims to have had this experience himself of, of being taken into on a vehicle into the sun by these angel scientists and, and who revealed to him that he was the supreme being, right? So that's, so that's part of uh, the background there in the United Nations of Islam. So by the time we get to 1985, Royal Jenkins is still around, Silas Muhammad is still around, all these other competing nations of Islam are still in existence. And they're probably roughly a dozen or so. And Louis Farrakhan claims in 1985 September 17th, uh, to have been taken into the mother wheel while he was on a uh, visit to Mexico, to the ruins of Quetzalcoatl on Tepozeco Mountain. And, um, and I suggest that, that this claim functions like you've already suggested to authorize him as the true leader and heir to the teachings of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so uh, we can we can we can start right there or or stop right there and and redress some issues. But I will I just want to make one more observation: the the difference between Farrakhan's claim in 1985 and Royal Jenkins in 1975, uh, for example, is that Louis Farrakhan claims to hear and encounter Elijah Muhammad directly mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. UFO encounter, and he also says that the presence of Master Fard Muhammad was also on the vehicle. And so, so that's, that's the difference there, mm -hmm. right? Royal Jenkins didn't hear from Elijah Muhammad directly, right? He wasn't summoned into this vehicle that Elijah Muhammad talked about, right? He didn't know uh, the same way Louis Farrakhan knows that this thing is absolutely real because Farrakhan had a bodily vision of it that was real for him. All right. So I'll uh, I'll stop right there for a while and we'll see which direction you all want to go. From there, I think um, we want to know more about this mother wheel and yeah. how I guess it fits into and how that's a good gateway to talking about the larger uh, Nation of Islam cosmology and and why there is UFOs, because uh -huh. you have a. a cosmic dimension to the the nation of islam's uh teachings and also i think it's important to talk about the who it is that is piloting the craft yeah that's very important and so if i get off track you all you'll help me to come back <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> sure. all right so let, let me let me go let me go back uh, uh to what the nation of islam claims as the history of the mother wheel they say it was created uh, that uh, Master Fard Muhammad created the mother wheel, built the mother wheel with, with Japanese scientists in the Japanese islands in 1929, right? And so Japanese also play really prominently in the Nation of Islam and in the mythology of the Nation of Islam um, and, uh, in a way, along with other racial groups that corresponds to the, your, your question about the pilots of the mother wheel. And so I need to say a little something about what the Nation of Islam means when they say black. Black for the Nation of Islam isn't what we mean in the United States. When we say black here, we're primarily talking about African-Americans uh, or those for, of African heritage. That's not what the Nation of Islam meant. It's a, it's a much more expansive category of blackness, what I call a surplus category, uh, because the, the, the meaning of the term as, as they use it uh, carries it, it's, it's much broader, much more expansive than than the category as we receive it in the United States. And so, so for them, black meant, and this is this is their language, not mine. Black, brown, red, and yellow. What they mean by that is that blackness encompasses largely the world of color, but especially Native Americans, Asians, Latinx folk and people of African descent. All of those folks are, are black. And so that's really important to understand. All right, so, so coming back to 
uh, September 17, 1985, uh, the Nation of Islam uh, makes these treks to Mexico uh, regularly. Uh, sometimes they call this Project Mexodus. They also make uh, pilgrimages uh, to Sedona, Arizona, which you'll find interesting. Yeah, that uh, is interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so they make pilgrimages to Mexico and Sedona, Arizona. Right. And so the picture that I want to build of the Nation of Islam is a group, and I don't think they'd appreciate this term, that is much more new age, that can, mm -hmm. can, can be understood much more in terms of the new age movement than it can, say, in mainstream, mainstream Islam. Right. Mm -hmm. And this, this is why I argue that the Nation of Islam is really misunderstood and really complicated. And so... Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Well, I, I noticed too, just looking at like the Wikipedia article, just when I was doing a little bit of research, kind of brushing up on the Nation of Islam, that apparently in recent years, Farrakhan has like dabbled and I guess reached out to Scientology. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'll say something about that now, and then we'll work our way back to the, to the UFO uh, phenomenon. Mr. Farrakhan is, is actually quite open-minded to all kinds of religious experience. Uh, uh, and religious knowledge. And one of the things that he, he argues is that, you know, the oppression of black people is, is really hard to break. Uh, it has really adversely affected every aspect of the lives of African Americans, including their self image and their psyches. And so anything useful to breaking through that, um, he's, he's, he's expressed being open to. And Scientology is, just happens to be one of those things. Mm -hmm. And so you have all of these folks in the nation of Islam who are now trained auditors in, uh, by Scientology and Scientology and the nation of Islam have an official relationship. And again, many members of the nation of Islam are also trained auditors. Um, but this is also, again, the, the, the point is that this is just another tool to help black people break through you know, the centuries of degradation and oppression that has even harmed how they see themselves. And so, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, it looks like sort of a, a, a complicated relationship that might be contradictory, but that's only if you believe the Nation of Islam as portrayed in the media and, and often on the internet. It doesn't surprise me that they have an official relationship with, with a religious group that's so white like, like Scientology. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me at all. The Nation of Islam has actually always had official relationships with other racial groups uh, and other religious groups. For example, they, they were in relationship with Sun Young Moon and the Unification Church, if you remember mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. This has always been the Nation of Islam. Why? Because they all they already understood black as this really expansive category. Right. It didn't include white people, but it included nearly everybody else. And so I actually argue that the Nation of Islam is, is in fact not insular, but is one of the most interracial relation groups in terms of their official relationships with others and their meaningful relationships with others. So back to 1985. And again, this was uh, September 17th. Uh, Louis Farrakhan uh, was in Mexico on Tepozeco Mountain. And about three years later, uh, about 30, 30 months to be exact, in October 1989, he holds this press conference to tell us about it. And this press conference was held at the JW Marriott in uh, Washington, D.C. And Farrakhan says that he had to wait this, this long because the cryptic message that he got from Elijah Muhammad needed some time to be clarified. And this was a time when he could tell us what, what, what happened, what he learned from Elijah Muhammad on the wheel. And so here's what he tells us. He says that on September 17th, 1985, he was with some friends of his climbing the ruins of Quetzalcoatl, which he had done many times before. This time, he had this vision of a wheel coming over the mountain. And he was afraid, right? Maybe he didn't recognize it at first. At some point, he recognizes it because he hears a voice coming from the wheel and says, not them, just you. 
because he had mm. called out to his friends. Mm -hmm. So after that proclamation that came from the wheel, this voice he heard, he said he was taken into the wheel where he heard the voice of his, uh, his prophet, who is alive bodily now, just as clearly as the two of you are hearing me right now. Mm -hmm. And here's what he says. He says, Elijah Muhammad revealed to him that the joint that Reagan and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were meeting to to develop a war against black youth under the guise of national security against black gangs, especially in California, Bloods and Crips. Mm. Louis Farrakhan said that this was actually a ruse. And this is what he learned from Elijah Muhammad. It was actually uh, it was actually a concealment of a genocidal plan to kill and incarcerate black youth under under the guise of a war on drugs. Right. And so it's interesting because in some ways this is precisely what happened. Yeah. Under under Reagan. But but this is what he tells us happens. Right. Uh, that he learned from Elijah Muhammad. And but it took 30 years for for this to become clear because Elijah Muhammad spoke to him in short cryptic sentences that at the time he didn't really understand. He heard his voice clearly, but he didn't understand. One of the reasons why he says he didn't understand is because he didn't see Elijah Muhammad's mouth move. He didn't hear he didn't hear uh, 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 Elijah Muhammad talking the way you are hearing me now. He heard Elijah Muhammad directly in his mind. Telepathy. Telep yeah. Exactly. It's as if Elijah Muhammad was writing cursively directly to his mind. And this is the way he talks about it. Right. That he was communicating this clearly. And so in 1989, this is what we get from him. Right. That he says the Joint Chiefs of Staff and uh, Reagan and Bush are meeting to devise this plan um, uh, to destroy black youth in the guise uh, of, of an extremely urgent um, war on drugs and, and against gangs, especially Bloods and Crips. And so he gives us a lot more details of what he saw and what he felt. He tells us, for example, that he saw the pilots of the wheel and the pilots were the races. They represented the four dominant aspects of the black race, that is black, brown, red, and yellow, to your question. Um, so even the pilots are interracial, but they're black, right, of this will. And, uh, and that's the gist of the revelation that he said he learned from Elijah Muhammad on the wheel. Is there documentation um, of him saying that in 1985? Yes. So, so, we don't, so we don't get, so I don't know if you're asking, so we, so we get documentation of exactly what happened from his words and his perspective yeah. in 1989, okay. whether there's record of him saying any of these things between 1985 and 89, I'm not clear. Right. But that would be very interesting because it's so prophetic. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. He said he had to wait, right? Mm -hmm. 30, 30 months. And incidentally, 30 is a really important, really important uh, number for uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan, right? And it's probably not coincidental that for the nation of Islam, uh, the, the same vision that Ezekiel had in the 30th year, by the way, of this wheel within a wheel yeah. was of this of this mother wheel. Right. And so they want they connect the mother wheel, the nation of Islam to uh, the prophet Ezekiel in that first chapter and his vision of the wheel within a wheel. In a, in a, uh, and so this number 30 keeps coming up. For example, let me give you another example. Louis Farrakhan joined the Nation of Islam in 1955. What year did he have this experience of, of, of the, uh, the mother wheel? 85. 1985. 30, 30 years. years. Yeah. 30 mm -hmm. years, right? And he's constantly pointing this out, right? 30 months, 30 years, over and over in, in, in his discourses so that you know that the number is significant for him. But again, the number 30 shows up in Ezekiel's vision, right? It was in the 30th year. And I think that may have something, something to do with it. Mm -hmm. So what we find then is lots of numerology, 
lots of new age thought, uh, lots of discourses about UFOs, all kinds of stuff going on in the nation of Islam, which, like I said, is really complicated. Yeah. Well, and the um, the prevalence of UFOs in their cosmology is because a as part of this challenge uh, to, you know, reject this imposed identity, um, a cosmic identity was That's one right. of the elements, um, you know, in addition to redefining their racial identity and spiritual identity as being a part of and from a larger traditions of Islam, That's this right. cosmic identity puts uh, what they would call black people as being trillions of years old. So That's there right. you kind of see that theosophical influence of there being this like these cycles of time that are just That's enormous. Exactly right. And you really see these cycles of time in their in what I call their mythology. Again, for them, it was it was it's their history, mm -hmm. right? That that Master Fard Muhammad taught Elijah Muhammad, right? And so they would jettison and and react to the term mythology. And I've been in meetings with them, right? I'm sure where, where, where they weren't because they're insistent that this is historical and scientific, right? Right. And, and looking right. at this as a scholar, I want to understand it as highly symbolic language. But this, but this mythology that you point to is very cyclical, just like you say. But, but, but I also want to add to this notion of black, in addition to being, you know, uh, uh, represented by uh, Native Americans, Asians, uh, Africans, and so on, it's also extraterrestrial. Right. right. So for Elijah Muhammad, there were also black people on Mars and Venus. Uh, and these black people on Mars and Venus lived to be 1,200 years old. They were nine feet tall and so on, right? And so, so black is both imminent and transcendent. And for, for me, that's also what the UFOs represent. If we see these UFOs as metaphors of black bodies or black bodies, bodies that have not been given any sense of transcendence, right? They're just bodies. They're just material. When black people are killed by the police or they die, they're just dead, right? There, there's no sense of, of transcendent value or meaning to these at all. They, they are, in, this, in the West at least, associated with and defined by their experience in slavery and a hundred years of lynching. And so I see these discourses as, as giving black bodies history, transcendence, nuance, and so on. And of course, for the nation of Islam, that, that black people are trillions of years old and created a technology that even NASA can't master, right? Means they're also the most intelligent bodies in the universe in a, in a history that's hundreds of years old, which argues that black people are intellectually inferior. So do you see how some of these things might function? For the yeah. nation of Islam to give new meaning to black bodies, it's a, right? it's an it's an empowerment. That's right. Mythology, yeah. That's exactly right. And so people people mis, mis, mistake these 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 symbols, which I see as exceedingly meaningful, and they make perfect sense to me for for something literal. Right. Uh, so, for example, when uh, uh, people say the nation of Islam. Um, uh, call white people devils, right? To me, that's, that's highly misunderstood. What they were trying to do is make sense of a reality that was, number one, terrifying, but number two, was overdetermined by white supremacy and racism and was characterized by hundreds of years of not only white racial terror, but all sorts of violence, not the least of which was lynching, mm -hmm. right? And so seen against that background, Right, you understand the sort of mythologies, the narratives that people come up with to try to make sense of a really absurd world because it makes no sense. Right, and right. and the other the other trigger for a lot of white folks would be the black man is God. Well, that's but exactly that's right. not meant to be literal either. That's meant to say that they have divinity within them and they are connected to God, just like you say all these other New Age type of religions. That's right, would. and. And for the nation of Islam, God had a body, right? Mm -hmm. God is material, not 
not the way. So they would have a problem with the Christian God. That God, and this is the term they use, that mystery God is a spook, right? And that's mm. the word they use, mm. right? God is no mystery for the nation of Islam. We knew who God was. He, he, he walked and lived with us, right? He was flesh just like us. So he can identify with us more than this spook God, right? This, this mystery God. He was black just like we were, right? And we knew him. And so for them, you're exactly right. God is actually quite material, right? Just like they are. And so uh, for Louis Farrakhan, um, you know, uh, the nation of Islam, what a part of the function of the nation of Islam is to create new gods. Uh, and part of what he means by that is, is people who can, can change the world, like Jesus, like Muhammad, like Buddha, and yes, like Louis Farrakhan, because he does see himself in that same tradition. He sees right. himself in the line of prophets. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and to a large extent, he sees himself as the seal of the prophets. Right. He is he is the logical conclusion of all of them. Right. And I've heard him say this myself. So, I mean, he sees himself as as ex extremely significant in the cosmology of prophets. Right. He's, he's central. But again, part of the nation of Islam Part of part of all their programs, their diet, their their dietary rituals, all of this is to produce other Farrakhans, which is to say black people can be can be gods. Right. They can be producers. Uh, they can be healthy. They can live long lives. All of these kinds of things where historically black life hasn't even been the, the national average. Even even now, African-American men don't even make it to the age where they would read, where they would receive uh, social security, right? Which is mm -hmm. 65, right? Life expectancy for black men is even below that, mm -hmm. right? And so again, what the picture that I'm trying to paint of all of this is set against this experience. These kind of things make sense in terms of what they're trying to do and, and what their mythologies and symbols mean. And this, this UFO phenomenon then was a message to all detractors and rivals that that Louis Farrakhan is the rightful heir and this is the true nation of Islam. The significance of calling it the mother will. Yes. You go into this quite extensively, one of these articles that you sent us, and why why the why the figure of mother? What is the, the importance of that? Well, I think there, there, are, there are a couple of things. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it is the term that they use, but part of the reason why they use that term is because the, the main plane or the main UFO, and again, it's just a UFO to us. They know clearly what this, what this vehicle is, right? It's unidentified to us because we, don't, we, we misrecognize it, right? But for them... Uh, this is this is this is the the vehicle that Master Fard started, and we're talking about the bigger vehicles has within it fifteen hundred smaller vehicles that they call baby planes or baby wheels, and so the metaphor becomes then mother that has within it these smaller planes. So I don't actually think that's an accident, right? As I as I unpack and point out in one of my one of my articles, because I, I think. I think if you want to understand the nation of Islam, you really have to take this UFO stuff seriously and give it mm -hmm. some real attention and try to unpack everything that's going on and what the symbols mean. And so part, part, of, the, part of what it means then is that they're going to be constrained here by a very heterosexual way of viewing the world, right? Because if this is a mother plane and the mother has these baby wheels within it, Mm -hmm. That means that heterosexuality is going to be normative. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? Otherwise, yeah. otherwise you don't have babies. And so these are the kind of symbols that I was trying to point to as, uh, uh, as reasons to, to center the UFO phenomena in understanding what the nation of Islam is doing. Right. And so this, this idea that these pilots of the mother wheel and these other vehicles represent all these races. Right. Again. All of that says something about how they understand the world and how they understand what it means to be black. Black is a much more expansive category 
than we understand it in the West and the U.S. But if you look at the pilots of the, uh, the, the mother wheel, they represent all of these races. And so I'm simply pointing out that if we look at the Nation of Islam as a symbol, or the, the mother wheel as a symbol, it tells us a lot about the cosmology of the, of the Nation of Islam, such that we can make sense out of a lot of things that Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam are doing and saying. In addition to the, uh, the influence from theosophy, um, you also point out some of the, the esoteric and, and Gnostic elements that were there. I, I do. And again, I want to point out that there are s some writers and scholars are the ones who, who claim the, the theosophical connection. Right, and, right. and it makes sense to me. But again, the Nation of Islam denies that connection. Right. And so the, the picture we get is, is of a, a, a new age esoteric religion that that constructs its its religious narrative from a lot of sources. Right. Right. Which and everything that was floating around in that early 20th century. That, that's exactly right. From theosophy, uh, they borrow heavily from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. They're taking stuff from Freemasonry. All kinds of things, which is, again, an aspect of New Age, but it's, but it's also one of the characteristics of Western esotericism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what they call praxis of concordance. So what happens in the nation of Islam, though, is that it ritualizes all of these things that are borrowed from, from other places to obscure the fact that, that they are borrowed, and it calls them Muslim. Right. Right. Well, and the, the the Orientalism of that the period that that the origin is in, just like why uh, you know Fard had a had this ambiguous identity, and he could do so much with it because of the uh, relative. Uh, uh, you know, we really hadn't been exposed to actual uh, Eastern religions in America, so you could use the you know the the symbolism and kind of make it whatever you wanted it to be. That's right. And that's also where Freemasonry becomes important. Right? The Shriners, absolutely. That, that, that's exactly right. And so you would notice that you, you, you asked me about Noble Drew Ali, right? But notice, but notice the term that he uses for himself, right? The founder of the Moore Science Temple America, Noble, right? Which is a term that comes from, from, uh, from Freemasonry, right? Mm -hmm. Nobles of the ancient Arabic mystic shrine and so on and so forth, right? And then, and then Master Fard Muhammad. Right. The founder of the nation of Islam, this term master. Right. It, it seems pretty clear to me that these are terms that come from uh, Freemasonry, of which Elijah Muhammad was a member. And it seems pretty clear that Master Fard Muhammad was also a member. And, but yet the, the, the nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad, again, mythologizes the symbols that show up in the nation of Islam as coming from Master Fard Muhammad in some right. way so as to obscure the fact that they probably originated in Freemasonry. Right. Right. And so he talks a lot about Freemasonry and the symbols of Freemasonry, Elijah Muhammad does, and how they point to the origin of the races and the significance of black people. Right. And he does address that. What do you think the, uh, to, I guess we're kind of going back to the origins, what, what do you think the World's Fair um, has to do with all that? Uh, it seems like it was the first time that Americans really uh, saw people, of, uh, you know, saw Eastern mystics, and they were able to, a lot of African Americans especially, were able to uh, adopt some of these identities, um, and they were able to be, uh, you know, stage people, magicians, performers, psychics, um, and then also, I believe, some of the... Um, I believe the the African American Shriners use the World's Fair as a point of contact contact to receiving their you know charters or whatever it is from the East. We're talking about 1893, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that's what I was going to ask you all because I'm not I'm not as clear about about that one. Well, at first when you said the World's Fair, I was thinking 1895 and the and the Atlanta Exposition, which is which is something very very different. But I'm right. not. I'm not exactly sure of the explicit connections with the World's Fair. Maybe you can say a little bit more about what you have in mind, and then if it be becomes clear the connections you make, uh, you want to make, I can. I can. I'll just 
Yeah, just through some of just through some of my research, I've really found that that um, that event really uh, served uh, kind of like as a just a springboard for a lot of new religious movements and alternative spiritualities in America. They had the World Parliament of Religions where uh-huh. Vivekananda came, and that was the first uh-huh. you know person uh, talking about Hinduism. We had Arthur Webb, who was uh, the first. Uh, white American convert to Islam. That's right. There, and uh, I've I've learned a lot of of this in a uh, a fellow named uh, Patrick Bowen. Uh, he's got these two collections: a uh, uh, history of conversion to Islam in the United States. Uh, there, there are two volumes. One is for uh, white Americans. One is for Black Americans. <laughs> and uh, he really explores that stuff and how. Uh, I guess the the World's Fair in Chicago is kind of this ultimate yep. um, destination in these mythologies of transmission of of Eastern esotericism. Yeah, and and that that makes sense to me. And I knew it was in Chicago, right? And so, within twenty years of that, you have all these new Black religious movements around Chicago and Detroit, right? And and the interesting thing is. By the time they show up by in the 1920s, some of them already appear pretty well developed, like the Moore Science Temple, which doesn't show up into, mm-hmm. uh, was supposedly founded in 1913. Some people dispute that in Newark, New Jersey. But by the time we see it in Chicago in the early 1920s, it's pretty well developed, which, which means that it, it, it's been around for some time. And so we, we are starting to see a lot of these uh, new religions and uh, African-Americans talking a lot about astrology, right? And tarot and all of these kind of creative things that, that you, some of which you saw in the South, but not to this extent. Right. And then, and then of course, you know, right around the 1930s, uh, uh, some, some of this a little bit before the 30s, you had great migration of African-Americans from the South who were both uh, looking for economic opportunities in the North and escaping racial terror. Right, and so now you had all these competing traditions, all this new stuff, which comes from many different sources, like you, like you point out, including the World's Fair, um, festivals that are even older, that uh, spiritualist festivals that go mm-hmm. back to, to the uh, uh, 17, uh, 1700s in Rochester, New York, uh, that that uh, uh, black people were doing, and former slaves, and so on, and all of this stuff seems to converge then in the north in the 20s and 1930s. And you get all these Hebrew and occult and Muslim groups and even some of these, these nationalist groups emerging in that milieu during mm-hmm. that time. Yeah, and you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I guess we can kind of turn, I want to turn this because I wanted to uh, explore the larger context that UFOs fit into in um, you have a piece called the supernatural and the African American experience. I believe that's that's part of a larger work. What is that's right. what's a larger work? What is that in? Well, the, the larger work. Well, it was actually a, a nine volume. I think it was a nine volume series, and I, I think that uh, Jeff Kripal was the general editor uh, of the series, and he mm-hmm. was a particular editor of this. I think this was volume nine, and I think it was called Super Religions or something to that effect. Okay. And it was it was all about uh, the kind of things we're talking about now: UFOs, esotericism, the paranormal, and so on. And um, they invited me to contribute uh, uh, the essay that you wrote on African Americans and the supernatural. Okay, and it it was really it was really good, and it and it fits all this into a larger context um, that you really stress this idea that uh, this. Uh, impose identity as the other uh, in the the U.S. and the Americas, uh, how it's influenced how African Americans have uh, perceived the other and that it's it's been a different relationship uh, than you see with other with other people and Europeans in America. Well, and, and one of the reasons why is because the the uh, the relationship, um, the the beginning of uh, the, the forced presence in America uh, was initiated by what could metaphorically be understood as a, a, a UFO abduction. 
right? And so, right. so, 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 so imagine this, uh, if you will. You're 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 in Africa, where everybody's black. You have your own way of life, your own cosmology, and so on. And all of a sudden, people show up in these ships, mm -hmm. and they're white. They have no color. You've never seen that before. They look like ghosts. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you mythologize them as dead ancestors who have returned, right? Because that's the, that's the only way you can make sense out of this. And all of a sudden, you're abducted. You're taken into these ships, and you're whisked away across oceans with the temporal dislocation, the, the, the geographical de, uh, disorientation. And you end up in this new world all of a sudden. I mean, if that's not metaphorically where, where, mm -hmm. where, look, where you're operated on, where you're, 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 you're treated in all kinds of terrifying ways. If, if that's not a metaphor for uh, an alien abduction, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, all, it, it pretty much literally is an alien abduction if you that's think right. about it. That's right. And this is what the Afro-pessimists are actually arguing, Afro-pessimism. Uh, is an is an area of thought and scholarship, and this is pretty much what they are they are arguing that it was an alien abduction. But if you look at the um, uh, the African American uh, UFO traditions against that background, and then uh, against a history of racial terror, I, I I think it might I think it begins to make some sense. And so I'm arguing again in that piece you read that. All of these UFO traditions, which is a which is a different tradition from what we might call mainstream ufology, right? See these aliens as very different. In some ways, in some ways, one might understand uh, aliens in these black traditions as 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 sort of a return to symbolically origins, right? A symbolic return to origins, and so. In almost all these traditions, they see aliens as black in one way or another, including the nation of Islam, even though their notion of black is really expansive. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about the uh, UFO twins, who are uh, two black women who live in Arlington, Texas, uh, who write about uh, um, a UFO experience with what they call galactics, those are the beings, they describe these galactics, and these are their words, as beautiful black women. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's a guy who uh, had a chance to talk to uh, uh, six or seven years ago. He's dead now. I think he died around uh, 2014 or so named Prophet Yahweh. Oh, right? yeah. Prophet Yahweh died. Prophet Yahweh died. So we're oh, not talking man. about Yahweh bin Yahweh of the nation of Yahweh. I remember Prophet Yahweh. All right. So Prophet yeah. Yahweh claimed to be able to summon UFOs. Remember that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And he had a UFO summoning school where he could teach you how to call UFOs, too. Yep. Right. And he also referred himself as a UFO caller. Right. And so for him, uh, these beings in these UFOs were also black. Right. And so there's, there's, there's a pattern here then that I think has to be understood against Afri African American experience in the United States to where these, 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 whatever they're claiming to experience, whatever the other is, is familiar and friendly to them, right? It's almost, it's almost a sense of reconnecting to a sense of origins, right? Of, of what yeah. black and who, what black really is and who black people really are. And even Louis Farrakhan says, right? He says, and this is a quote, we are people of the wheel, right? You look at us, but you do not know us, hmm. right? Right. So for him, there's something transcendent that is connected to this this UFO in particular, the mother wheel, but which you find in all these other black traditions too. Right. A certain connection, a, a sense of home, a sense of identity, friendliness, all of that, which which makes it a really distinct UFO tradition. Absolutely. You also explore the the. Um the influence on spiritualism and that a lot of what spiritualism became may not have just been with the Fox sisters, that there That's might have right. been a, a really strong influence from African-Americans in the area. 
that's, that's well right. documented. And I, and I and I alluded to some of that when I talked about uh, Rochester in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And was it called? I think the Pinkster Festival or, or something something like that. Yeah, yeah, where, that was it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Where, where African Americans were were given some space and time where where they could just do their thing and be free. And back in the 1700s, even during this time, they were communicating with ancestors, right? They were they were doing what we would call mediumship and communicating with with quote unquote spirits, right? For them, they were ancestors and and others. But and this but this precedes the Fox Sisters, right? And but it's in the same geographical location as the Fox Sisters, right? Rochester, New York. And so again, I'm I'm simply arguing in that piece that African American spiritualism, African American religion, uh, all of these ideas of UFOs. Are, are, are really complicated, but, but that they cause us to reevaluate all kinds of American religious history because these narratives, again, the Pinkster Festival, uh, these UFO traditions, including Nation of Islam, don't show up in the scholarship on American religion very often. Yeah, and, and they cause true. us, I think, to reevaluate the nature and history of American religion, right? And that's partly what I'm trying to what I'm trying to point out in that in that essay that we're talking about here. What about uh, a couple other people I wanted to ask about, and just like um, when well, you got, you also talk about Sun Ra, yeah, uh, George Clinton, yeah. You know, I mean, like you know, I I I, I did get to see the the uh, mothership in the Smithsonian. <laughs> Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I took a I picture of it. I don't think. Uh, uh, at the Smithsonian uh, too long. I, I think it was actually, it may have been a, in a junkyard. It was somewhere in Detroit, right, for, for some time. I actually think it was in Detroit and, uh, and it made its way to the Smithsonian. I was happy to read about that. Yeah, yeah. But, but like, I never knew that like an actual encounter. I just thought all that was just stuff that he was like, I didn't, but I guess that was important to him as well. That's right. And, uh, which I kind of can't believe that that didn't make, um, that second season of, uh, tales from the tour bus when they did the, the show about George Clinton. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but like, you know, what about Barney Hill? You know, it's interesting because I see Barney Hill as a, as a different tradition. Uh, yeah. and maybe that's me imposing something on him. Maybe not. But I, but I see Barney Hill, and we're talking 1961 New England, mm -hmm. as, as really different from, from this other tradition that I see as right. much more distinctly African-American. Right? And Barney's was not as empowering at all. It was a terrible experience to him. That's yeah. exactly right. At the same, at the same time, some might argue, though, that what was going on, you know, because, again, he was interracially married, yes. was, was, a, was a background against the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? we've explored that. Yeah, That's right. absolutely. That's right. So, so, it's, so it's not that it's not significant where race is concerned. I, I think mm -hmm. it is very significant. But I, but I don't see it as part of this tradition that we're talking about. George Clinton, Nation of Islam, UFO twins. Prophet Yahweh, United Nuwabian Nation of Moors, Sun Ra, and so on. Right? I see that mm -hmm. as a really distinct African American tradition that really, that really symbolically, that African Americans use symbolically to point to origins and to reimagine black origins mm -hmm. that are that are not racially uh, overdetermined by slavery and notions of inferiority and lynching and Jim Crow and so on. And you just don't you, you don't necessarily see that in uh, the the Barney the Betty and Barney uh, yeah. UFO abduction. I mean, even even George Clinton points to, to in his in his UFO experience points back to Africa and the ancient Dogons and their cosmology, right? As stargazers, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, right. You don't see that in in Barney Hill, even though it's still significant. Yeah, I, I have heard that too. That uh, a lot of people have talked about that 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 was a terrifying abduction for them. That some of that had to do with some of the the, the pressure of being an interracial couple in 1961, right, in New England, 
Uh, there's a lot of scholarship that has been done on that, and just people have, have, have speculated that. And you're right that yeah. that does include into a whole other tradition because pretty much the hill, like that's the basic um, seminal abduction case. That's right. You know, that's the beginning of it. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, you know, why some of this uh, this African American tradition. You know, a lot of this stuff is is not in mainstream ufology. Nobody talks about this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. you know, it, it, I, I I just wonder why that is and why some of that some of it has been ignored. So so I can't say why writers who are primarily white who are doing this work are uh, why these black traditions uh, don't register for them. Right? Are virtually invisible. I think there are a few articles in some of these uh, UFO religion uh, uh, edited volumes on the Nuwabians, uh, mm -hmm. United Nuwabian Nation of Mordor, one or two, but that's really it. And remember, now, and, and I'm not saying this is true, but it's plausible, the Nation of Islam says they were actually first. So we, we point, for example, to, like you just said, to uh, uh, Betty and Barney, 1961, as the seminal event. But the Nation of Islam says they were actually prior to that. And they actually started, and this is their explicit argument, they actually started this modern UFO phenomena and that it has everything to do right. with the Nation of Islam, right? And yeah. this, is a very, yeah. this is a very important claim for them, right? And re remember, they're saying it was 1942 when some of their records, now I don't, I don't know, I can't say, I can only tell you what they say, but it was 1942 when they, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam was raided by the FBI. And the FBI took all these records, including uh, drawings of the mother wheel, right? That that uh, Elijah Muhammad had been taught about. And, and remember, that's forty-two, not forty-seven, right? So it's so it's five years before them. Again, yeah. this is their claim, and none of these traditions show up um, in 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 the scholarship, let alone in the popular sort of discourses and imagination about UFOs. Uh, I, I do think that um, some people find it uh, interesting. Uh, David Halperin is one. You, you all probably know of his work mm -hmm. um, and his new book with Stanford University Press, Intimate Alien. Uh, he was doing a lot of work on some of these black traditions. Uh, but in his blog post, he says that a lot of the work on the black traditions in his book got cut out because the book was too long. But he, he probably recognized, at least as early as I did, if not earlier, that these black traditions were different, that these, these, these black UFO religious groups were a different thing, mm -hmm. right? And so, so I have to give him uh, credit and recognize that, uh, that he was talking about this, right? Even though he hadn't really done any, you know, had to publish any articles or anything like that. He was talking about it and even mentioning some of this in his blogs. And so... But but other than that, uh, uh, people like David Halpern and the few articles on you know a group here or there that hasn't been there hasn't been much worth in, in including scholarship and yet these groups have been around in the in America as long as any of the others. Yeah, I mean it's it's just amazing, and I can't give you an answer about. But even why they people don't show interested, them. yeah, even people interested in new religious movements um, tend to neglect them. And it's I, absolutely fascinating. You have everything, you know, with the, the way that they've splintered, with their mysterious origins. I mean, it's really right. fascinating stuff if you're interested in new religious movements. That's right. But the Nation of Islam has always been involved in the UFO movements in the United States. And people just didn't know it. Remember the MIT UFO conferences? I think yeah. it was one or two. The yeah. Nation of Islam was, was attending those. Oh. Right? Yeah. They were there. Right? Mm -hmm. They talk about it. They write about it. They were there. They've always been involved in the UFO movement in the United. I'm surprised nobody noticed, right, all these years, um, because at these national conferences, they, they've always attended uh, many of those, including the MIT conference. Well, this is fascinating stuff, man. Uh, you know, this just the, how this this phenomenon, uh, whatever it is, uh, is you know interpreted through different communities with different experiences. And it if we can kind of get all these different perspectives, you know, it helps us put it all put it all together and uh, I agree. 
to you know cross reference them and see what commonalities they have, what differences they have, and it's a lens to all these other things. That's right. That's right. And of course, of course, some argue that uh, UFO phenomena are are related across culture but that there's a cultural aspect to how folks experience them and interpret them. And there's probably mm -hmm. some truth to that, right? And so that's why, like you're suggesting, we, we get a better picture when we can put more of these together, right? And see what they're saying ab about our world, right? And of course, that's also why they're important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you find that as being a professor of religion that now... I guess, especially in the last few years, I mean, you got Jeffrey Kripal out there, Diana Pasulka, yourself. I mean, is religion like, like, the religious scholarship starting to take the UFO narrative more seriously? <laughs> I laugh because uh, uh, Greg Bishop uh, asked me the same the same question, and um, and. So there are two ways of looking at this. I think if we if we answer it in a general sense, there are, more people are studying it. You you just you just pointed to some who are really significant, well respected scholars, uh, including David Halperin, who are interested in the phenomena. In my particular work on African American religion, I don't know that anyone's really taking it seriously as 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 a phenomena that's related to African American religion hmm. and culture. And so uh, in my particular field, it's really dominated by a black church studies norm. Mm -hmm. And so African-American religion to a lot of people still means black churches. Okay. And mm -hmm. so I would say in a similar way that these UFO traditions don't show up in, in white scholarship or in general scholarship on UFO religions, they also don't register in African-American religion the scholarship of African-American religion very well. So I, I remember, uh, I forget where I was going, and, uh, and I was at an airport. And uh, David Halperin, I don't know if you, ever, if you saw his blog post, he did a series of two or three blog posts just specifically on my work. And, uh, and I saw somebody in the, in the airport who, uh, who does some aspect of African-American religion. I don't know if it's biblical studies, theology, ethics, or African-American religion you know, more properly understood as a study of these traditions and phenomena. Uh, but he asked me about that, and, and he, just, he just said, I didn't know what to do with that. Right? <laughs> he clearly just said, and it was kind of funny to me, right? Because he said, I didn't know what to do with that. And that's the response I get, right? People just don't know, even those who study African-American religion, what to do with this and what to do with, 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 with the direction I'm trying to go. But what, I'm, what I think I'm really trying to say is that these are religious traditions that are just as significant for understanding African-American religion and African-American religious experience than some of these mainstream traditions. In some ways, I might even push that further and say maybe they're even, even more emblematic. Maybe they're even rep more representative of, of African-American religious experience. And, um, and I think by including them, we get a much more complicated picture of not only black religious history, but also a uh, theory of African-American religion and theory of religion more generally. And I mm -hmm. think that's where I'm going by, by trying to include these, these traditions that, that very few others are talking about. I'm trying to get yeah. a fuller sense of, yeah. of what African-American religious culture look like. Mm -hmm. A much better cool. sense. It's fascinating, and uh, you're definitely being a, a trailblazer there. Um, definitely respect you for that. I mean, it's got to it's got to be difficult, but you're doing really good work. That's well, going to be well, uh, well. You you just read my mind. I was going to say you you know it's tough being a trailblazer, right? It's it's even, <laughs> yeah. look, it's even tough getting published sometimes. Uh, and I I think I'm I think I'm through that difficulty, but it's it's challenging doing work that I'm calling African American religion that hasn't really registered as African-American religion, you know, over the decades, which has largely been understood as, as black churches uh, and maybe even Islam and a few other little things, but not the stuff I'm talking about. And so um, it is a challenging road to take. Um, but, but I do think that uh, what scholars 
uh, like Diana and Jeff and David and some others are doing in some ways is creating a space as well for the work that I'm doing. So, so I think it's really important in that sense Be because they're, they're publishing too. And they're publishing with some of these mainstream presses as mm -hmm. well and journals and university presses. And so I'm hoping that that in some ways causes sort of a shift in what's seen as legitimate work and important work in the study of religion. Well, what, what are you working on uh, right now and do you have a plan for the future? I'm working on a project. Well, I'm working on actually uh, four projects, but, but the newest project is on an African-American uh, early 20th century mystic uh, who was also a theosophist by the name of Robert T. Brown. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm arguing that, that uh, Robert T. Brown, in his work, uh, we, we see ideas that were important, important for understanding theory of religion. So that's basically what I'm what I'm getting from him. Uh, he puts the occult together with what some would understand as quantum mechanics and mathematics and philosophy, and he constructs what 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 he thinks is a, a view of who human beings really are and what the nature of the world actually is. And I want to understand that in terms of theory of religion. And so um, he was an African-American, like I said, who was a mystic, uh, who wrote without benefit of being able to reveal his, his racial identity because his fear was that he wouldn't get published and that people wouldn't take his work seriously. And he was probably right. And in 1919, uh, he publishes this massive book uh, called The Mystery of Space, literally theorizing space. Uh, which was uh, reviewed by theosophists, by physicists, and by mathematicians, who, all of whom saw promise in this work and reviewed it uh, positively. Uh, and so uh, my current project is on, is on Robert T. Brown uh, and theory of religion. So, so I, haven't, I haven't read a lot of Pascal Beverly Randolph, but the interesting thing is, is that even before Robert T. Brown joins theosophy. The earliest we, we know that he joined theosophy was around 1915, but he was reading Randolph even before that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to reduce even Brown to theosophy because he was reading people like Brown or uh, Randolph and drawing from other sources that were available uh, in African-American communities even before he became a theosophist. But yeah, Pascal Beverly Randolph was very significant for Robert T. Brown. Uh, but Robert T. Brown was also, I also want to see him as sort of a precursor to the Harlem Renaissance, right? And I want to understand Harlem Renaissance following John Woodson, who does the most, the most meaningful and thorough work on this as a black esoteric movement. Interesting. Right? So, so that's the huh. person you really ought to talk to about the Harlem Renaissance is John Woodson. Because for, for, for Woodson, and so we're talking about the 20s, right? The 1920s, yeah, yeah. the mid-1920s, right? And so Robert T. Brown was already in Harlem at that time. He was in New York when uh, The Mystery of Space was published in 1919. And he's reading some of the same occult sources as the, the later Harlem Renaissance writers, right? Including Zora Neale Hurston, Robert Schuller. Uh, Nella Larson, and so on, right? And so John Woodson argues that you actually cannot understand what the Harlem Renaissance writers are, are actually doing and saying unless you understand Gurdjieff wow. and, and uh, A.R. Oraj, uh, who was one of his, his disciples, and these other occultists who were being coded in Harlem Renaissance literature. And this is what John Woodson is arguing. And wow. so I want, I want to see Robert, Robert T. Brown as a precursor to that, who mm -hmm. was also reading uh, uh, people like uh, Gurdjieff. Uh, and, uh, oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a book that he was arguing about uh, that ex escapes my mind here uh, right now that I wish I'd come up with. But he's reading all these occult sources mm -hmm. prior to the Harlem Renaissance, right? Um, uh, 
who uh, and, and these writers are again in this private community of of literary uh, figures and 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 philosophers uh, like Alan Locke uh, and artists. But we see their stuff on on the surface, and we don't realize that this was an African American occult movement, right. right? They were making interventions into Gurdjieff for for black people that were significant for them, right? Um, uh, and and other occult writers, right? And and not a lot of people are aware of that. And so again, uh, I want to see Robert T. Brown as a precursor to that. And it seems pretty clear that these Harlem Renaissance uh, uh, writers who were led, by the way, by Jane Toomer, who, who studied directly with Gurdjieff, mm -hmm. right? It's also clear that they were aware of, uh, of Robert T. Brown. I'm not sure they liked him. I'm not sure they liked him. But it does seem that uh, Melvin Tolson, who was also part of this Harlem esoteric movement, uh, was aware of Robert T. Brown. And so all of this stuff is related to yeah. uh, the current project that I'm working on, which is probably going to be pretty massive. Uh, wow. Because there is no study on Robert T. Brown like that. He's basically an unknown figure in African American history, in theosophical history, in American history. Hardly anybody knows who he was. And yet, this is a guy who was a giant during his time. If you ever right. heard of Marcus Garvey, oh yeah, Universal. Well, well, he worked with Marcus Garvey, and he he was the editor of the Negro World, which was Marcus Garvey's newspaper. But he was also really close to Carter G. Woodson who was, quote unquote, the father of black history, right? And so, Arthur Schoenberg and all these other giant figures in New York and around the country. Yes. So with a, like, that, like that connection to Marcus Garvey, I mean, is there almost like an influence of that, like Rastafarianism? Well, I want to understand uh, Marcus Garvey much more in terms of new thought than Rastafarianism. Okay. Yeah. He was yeah. much more influenced by by new thought than he was that and and again uh i, I just want to push how we understand african-american religion and i'm talking you know m mostly right now to scholars of religion that that maybe it's time that we take a step back and that we we revise african-american religious history in light of the occult and the esoteric yeah right yeah. Mm. which which mm -hmm. even functioned and continues to function in black churches Yes, but it doesn't show up very often in scholarship, unless we're talking about works like Yvonne Chirot, uh, who wrote the book Black Magic, who said 19th century African American Christianity was indistinguishable from magic and conjure, right? Mm. Or Thee Smith, who even argues that the way African Americans treat and read the Bible is is as a conjure book, right? And so we we really have to take a step back and reevaluate. Very Wait, and maybe reinterpret African American religious history in light of the occult. Sounds like that's a big missing puzzle piece, yeah. That's right. That's right. Wow. Well, this was a f absolutely fascinating discussion, Dr. Finley. This was uh, I, I wow. appreciate it. And yeah, both I agree. You. I agree. Yeah, we, we really appreciate you coming on. This has been eminently fascinating. Where can people see any of your work or anything, or just like uh, the view? view your writings or, or anything? My book on the Nation of Islam is under contract with uh, Duke University Press. And um, I hope it appears as soon as possible, but it looks like it's going to be uh, 2021. Okay. Um, uh, my work um, uh, on Robert T. Brown is not under contract yet, but it has been reviewed and it will go to the board. I won't say the press yet, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's a pretty significant press. Uh, and once it's under contract, I'll make that announcement. Uh, but I'll be working on the Robert T. Brown project for the next few years. It probably won't appear till 2023 because it's just it's just a ton of work mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of tracking. So uh, those are the those are the main pro uh, projects. I have a, a, a volume coming out uh, with Edinburgh University Press on basically on race and religion, which is an interpretation of uh, of the the current political and religious moment in America right now. Um, that will be out in September. That's called The Religion of White Rage. Uh, and I'm actually working on another co-authored book uh, on something kind of unrelated on Black faculty studies uh, uh, with Biko Mandela Gray. 
and Lori Latrice Martin, and that's under contract with Johns Hopkins University Press. So I actually have four books in pro in various stages. Wow. Right <laughs> Busy man. That's a lot going on. That's right. excellent. All right. Well, Dr. Finley, thank you so much. Um, hold on the line for us. We're going to close sure. out this section. Pretty impressed, man. Um, what, your, what were your thoughts on that? Oh, uh, it's just uh, once a... Uh, even when uh, Greg just announced that he was going to be on there and I got to check out some of his research, I was just really, uh, really looking forward to it because uh, it crosses over a lot of uh, my studies into new religious movements and um, a lot of which started through kind of the turn of the century when I was coming of age and, and um, reading all the like Hakim Bay stuff that Mm -hmm. was really into the mythology of the more science temple the origin that just i love mysterious origin stories of religions um that aren't you know too many centuries away um i really like mysterious figures and being able to to try to crack a code like that which uh i've been interested with a lot of uh the african-american movements um and then also mormonism and just all over the place. It's really, it's really fascinating to me. Yeah, the Nation of Islam stuff is extremely fascinating. I, uh, I mean, like I said, I knew about some of the UFO stuff, but I never realized that it went that deep into yeah. it. It was maybe something well, it, that I saw it, on a blurb or something in, in a book or something like that. Well, and it's something that's really, um, it's like really triggering to a lot of people, and they can't look past. They can't look past being offended um, to, you know, study things as movements and phenomena in the sociology. Uh, you know, I've never been afraid to, like, study things like that, you know? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really, really good point. Um, once you kind of get past some of the things and you can kind of just look at it from a whole different point of view, it's, it's really really fascinating stuff so we are still gearing up guys for the strange realities conference we want to thank the people that have bought tickets so far um by the time this is out the tickets will be about twenty dollars and we've basically got about 20 people so if you think about it that's about a dollar a speaker to, to see these people speak and of course this is online this year and you can find out about that at strangerealitiesconference.com. So we want to see you guys um, come and and be a be a part of this online this year. Yeah, if you've heard the whole lineup by now, I mean it's mm -hmm. it's amazing and it's really a uh, real diverse spread of all the different types of things that we explore on Conspire Normal. Yes, absolutely. And some of our everybody that uh, is involved has been on this show has been yeah. on this show at least once. So uh -huh. you guys are, are going to hear people that we really respect and we really like in this field. And um, we're going to have Aaron Gullius next week and Greg Bishop and a nice little round table that we're going to do. And Brent Rains is going to come on the show. And so you're going to hear a lot of these people that are going to be presenting, talk about it um, going forward. And Patreon, uh, we are putting up still all the material presentations from last year. So if you are interested in seeing those before we do a big streaming event in August, where we're going to stream all the, um, <clears throat> we're going to stream all those presentations on one day. Um, $1 gets you into Patreon. So, and Surfiel can tell you where to go to find that. You can go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal, or you can make a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com. T-shirts up on tpublic.com slash conspiranormal store. You guys can check that can check that out. All the usual stuff, iTunes reviews, give us a five-star review, give us a 
Subscribe to us on YouTube, X and Paranormal Podcast. Even if you don't watch YouTube videos, still subscribe. And I think that's it. So we're going to close out the show. Unless you got anything to add, Sergio? No, just uh, see you guys next week on Conspiracy Paranormal. YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.